loan me a minute, let me borrow your ear, and I'll sing you a song about Leonard Peltier. He's gone so long in a federal jail, and there ain't no way that you could pay his bail. In South Dakota, where the fear has grown, where the presidents are watch from a mountain of stone, they say all people are free to roam. There ain't no freedom in the Indian home. Dealing with a third, uh, a fourth victim, in which the government had to have a scapegoat because of the version, the diversionary tactic that they created to discredit our people through the media to get away with the acts of what they're not doing today, and that's exploiting the resources from our land. And that was when the agents made their play in a gunshot battle on a deadly day, and three men died in the hollow sand to FBI and an Indian man. I think many people always ask, well, why did the shootout happen? What was going on? But people just don't know that during that very same time period, Richard Wilson, who was then the acting tribal chairman, was in Washington, D.C., signing away one-eighth of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the Black Hills of South Dakota, which is 133,000 acres of land and valued at billions of do dollars of uranium deposits that are being strip mined out of there by over 40 corporations today. The charge was set for homicide, but Leonard got away to the Canada side, where he lived for a while in the northern town, till they came up and got him and brought him back down. And today we have a liberation of Lakota people who have occupied 800 acres of land, which is now called the Yellow Thunder community, which is one of the richest areas in which the deposits are, are laying. And so the government is very uptight about this at this time. The judge and the jury, they both agreed. Two times murder in the first degree. They pounded the gavel and they rang on a bell. Two times life in a federal cell. Citations came from Washington, congratulations on a job well done. To agents gone is a mighty price, but if you want something bad, you gotta sacrifice. Well, there's many books on, on domestic surveillance, on counterintelligence programs, I mean, the Fred Hampton case. Those were real cases where police agencies violated civil and human rights and even according to their own ethics, violated law enforcement, eth codes of ethics. People need to understand that that's true, those are facts, and if they ever allow us, for example, in the case of Leonard Peltier, very soon, we hope to prove that. And now Leonard Peltier is a captured man with both legs taken so he cannot stand. One more swallowed by the master plan to get their hands on the Indian land. Spotlight Leonard Peltier, a man who is recognized internationally as a political prisoner, being held in jail in the United States. His story tonight on Alternative Views. Good evening. Tonight on Alternative Views, we're going to have an in-depth look at kind of two aspects of one subject, the Native American and how the Native American is treated in the United States. It has to do with civil rights. What happens when the U.S. power structure decides that, hey, we don't like these people? It results in political prisoners. Also, the program tonight will give us an insight into the thinking and culture 
of the Native American and how in touch with the universe and nature these people still are. We'll see that later in an interview with the cousin of Leonard Peltier, the political prisoner who is in jail. But first we'll have some news. I saw an article in the Christian Science Monitor about midway through August about Union Carbide, and they've been having quite a bit of trouble. You may, may remember the incident in Bhopal, India, where 2,000 people were killed and another 200,000 were injured. Well, shortly thereafter, they had a leak at a plant in Institute, West Virginia, and more than 130 people were treated for problems with their eyes, lungs, nose, and throat, and another 30 were hospitalized overnight. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is despite the Union Carbides going out and investing $5 million in safety devices for the Institute plant. They apparently didn't work as well as they thought they were. I th the One of the... Uh, salient points in this article, they mentioned that if this case is tried in a U.S. court, it could uh, very much undercut Union Carbide's claim that the Bhopal accident occurred because of procedural errors on the part of the Indian workers. In other words, the Institute accident could be used as evidence of a pattern of sloppy safeguards by Union Carbide themselves. Now, I also, uh, last March, I think it was, I cut an article out of the Wall Street Journal. I'm an inveterate newspaper cutter. And I hung on to it because I thought it might prove interesting eventually, and I think, uh, I think it proved, uh, proved me right here. The article is a front-page story dealing with insurers. It seems that they're uh, shunning covering chemical and other pollution-causing industries. Uh, this, actually, this dates back to 1982 when the EPA ordered hazardous waste facilities to get liability insurance against chemical accidents in the wake of numerous revelations. One, for instance, I reported on a couple of years back, one ent enterprising young uh, truck driver, he had a tank full of toxic waste to dispose of, and he wasn't sure what to do with it, so he, all he did was open up the spigots on the back of his truck and drove up and down the highway until it was all gone. Also, they, they came out and said that they had to have insurance. Well, the problem is that in the last few months, remember this is in March, the pollution liability insurance field has virtually collapsed, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported. They said that rates have climbed 50 percent, 200 percent, and even higher. And on top of that, coverage has been curtailed sharply with maximums reduced to $10 million or less. And all but three or four of the 14 companies and pools that issued this kind of insurance have pulled out, including the number one company, that's Shan Morahan and Company of Illinois, who last year insured 30 to 40 percent of the market. One of the insurance men was quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying, pollution claims hold out the prospect of widespread insolvencies among the major carriers of insurance for these companies. Environmental regulators keep trying to make insurers the cowcatcher on the regulatory locomotive. So what this boils down to is that the law still requires these companies to buy insurance, but now there aren't very many insurance companies that are really willing to, to bet that they're not going to have accidents. Frank, you got something over there for us? Well, I hope so. <clears throat> Here are just a few little quotes from Reagan, some of you may have heard before. He came out on a little advertisement blurb for the magazine The Nation. Here's one I hadn't heard. Reagan on the environment said, uh, There is today in the United States much more forest. No, he said, There is in the United States today as much forest as there was when Washington was at Valley Forge. <laughs> That's a miracle. <laughs> and now we turn to the centerpiece of tonight's alternative views, the American political prisoner, Leonard Peltier. Remember many months ago when Andrew Young said, hey, we got some political prisoners in the United States. Everybody said, oh, not in the United States of America, the Stars and Stripes and all this. What an uproar. But... That's about as far as it went. Nobody said, hey, Andrew, who are they? And uh, how do they happen to get there? Why are they political prisoners? We've talked quite a bit on alternative views about this subject. And tonight we're going to focus on one bona fide political prisoner in the United States, Leonard Peltier. You ever heard of him? Leonard Peltier. Perhaps not. The mass media haven't done too much on him, if anything. Well, we have... Two people who are going to fill you in on Leonard Peltier. 
what happened to him, how he was railroaded into prison, how the FBI was involved with tampering of witnesses, harassment, scaring of witnesses, doctoring of evidence, withholding of evidence, right up and down the line, right through the trial judge. Can this happen in the United States? Well, it already has. And who else more than Leonard Peltier? Well, we don't know yet. But we're going to look at Leonard Peltier tonight very, very closely. We have Raul Salinas, who is the representative from the southwest region of the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. And we're very privileged to have a cousin of Leonard Peltier, Steve Rabadou. Can you tell us first, for the people who don't know, the history of the Peltier case? Sure, I'd be glad to. Well, Leonard Pe Peltier, first of all, is a Lakota. He is a member of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, in which he is from the section of North Dakota. And presently, Leonard is in prison doing two consecutive life sentences for original charges, which were aiding and abetting in the deaths of two FBI agents on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, which took place on June 26, 1975. Now, on June 26, 1975, there was a shootout that had taken place in which two FBI agents illegally entered the reservations to serve fabricated arrest warrants, which, were, which they were never able to produce in the trials, okay? Now, immediately upon the agents entering the reservation, they came in, two agents, one in each unmarked car, radios and heavy equipment, and immediately a firefight had broken out. As a result of a firefight that had lasted for approximately eight and a half to ten hours, there was two FBI agents and one Indian man by the name of Joseph Stuntz, who, who to this day has never, we have never had an investigation into the circumstances of his death. Immediately, the, the FBI put out to the media that militant Indians, uh, hostiles, terrorists who were trying to take over the reservations had killed two FBI agents and there was a manhunt out for these so-called Indians. Eventually, four men were arrested and charged with aiding and abetting in the deaths of two FBI agents. Leonard Peltier, Dino Butler, Bob Rabideau, and a young man by the name of Jimmy Eagle, who later the charges were dropped because he was the, he was the person in which the government had claimed their reason for going in with the arrest warrants, which was for assault and robbery, was their excuse. Uh, charges were dropped on him. Now. Leonard was underground for some time, facing already convictions through the media being put on the 10 most wanted list, even before he had went to trial, labeling him as a, as a cop killer, as a slayer. Um, when he was captured in Canada, Dino Butler and Bob Robert were captured in the United States, and they went on trial in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 1976, while Leonard went on trial in Canada, fighting political asylum in Canada. Uh, fearing that if he was returned back to the United States, he would not receive a fair trial or possibly be killed, um, and also in recognition as being a member of the American Indian Movement. He was one of the leaders of the American Indian Movement, yes. is that correct? Yes, he was recognized throughout many communities as, as an organizer for the people. Yes, he, he had a very responsible job and was recognized to that effect. Mm -hmm. Steve, but, what were some of the things he did in the American Indian Movement? What were some of his political activities that made him a target for the FBI. Well, I, I think one of the most important things to really clarify in a brief way is that through the years, people have labeled the American Indian Movement as militant and radicals to the media that was presented by the government agencies to the media. We, in turn, have had to survive this attack on our people because the whole philosophy of the American Indian Movement was to stand for the honoring of over 372 treaties signed with different nations in the United States and Canada, and, and which today have never been honored. Not only the, the honoring of the treaties, but the traditional forms of government of many nations, the philosophies of their culture and their spiritual ways within their own land base which is very serious because we see through the system today that the education system of America has did nothing but not only destroy native people's language and took in their land base, but it's attacking people around the world, such as, we, such as we've heard tonight about uh, El Salvador. The people are struggling for their land and their rights, this, their rights to survival, and this is what the American Indian is all about today. I don't like to use the term American Indian, but people are educated to identify us like that, so we'll respect it that way to a degree. But regardless, 
These here were Leonard's duties to learn those traditions and those philosophies, but at the same time we had to deal with society in which our people have been forced to live on how we survive in this education system today, in the society on how we have to provide for our families. We have to learn an education to do this. And so in order for us to have equal rights, we're, which, were, which were being denied minority people throughout every urban community in the country, uh, welfare programs, education programs, uh, halfway houses for offenders, orphanages for the children. Even our old folks were sent to foster homes because they, they, we didn't have nobody to take care of them. We couldn't even take care of ourselves, yet alone worry about the respect that we used to maintain for our elders and our children. See, so these are philosophies and these are experiences that Leonard had was going through at the time of all this this bad media that was facing our people struggling for these real changes. Indeed. He was a hunter and he was a provider. He some, was a provider for the people. One of the more concrete uh, tasks that Leonard carried out, again, what Steve is referring to is the relocation of people from the reservations into the urban areas, especially during the 50s, uh, late 40s and 50s, where native people came to urban um, areas and, and the shock of being away from the reservation, uh, and then the lack of employment, the lack of skills, the alcoholism which runs rampant in Indian country. And when we say Indian country, we mean through the Americas. Uh, and so Leonard was, for example, in Milwaukee, an alcoholic counselor. Uh, he had a, a people's workshop of auto mechanics to work on people's cars that were on the trails and, and traveling uh, across the land. Um, to support uh, Indian people's causes. And so, aside from that, his spiritual duties, which encompassed being a pipe carrier and a sun dancer, um, enabled him to talk to some of our youth and always took young people with him on the trail, as we say, when he had to go do a job like speak or gather people for a fishing, uh, honoring fishing ceremony or, or those things. Uh, as part of what Leonard's work entailed. Getting back to the case then, the other people involved or charged were also acquitted. Of All right. charges, See, were yeah. they not? See, we were right at that part to where Leonard was fighting yeah. extradition in Canada. Now, Dino and Bobby were going on trial in Cedar Rapids, Iowa at that time, and they were acquitted on grounds of self-defense and misconduct of the FBI. Okay, it was proven even by Clarence Kelly's testimonies throughout that trial that they, that they did have a counterintelligence program designed on the American Indian movement, and they did believe that they were, they were honest people struggling for social change and, and rights for the people. You know, I mean, we had all these positive energies come out, but see, we're dealing with a third, uh, a fourth victim in which the government had to have a scapegoat because of the, version, the diversionary tactic that they created to discredit our people through the media to get away with the acts of what they're not doing today, and that's exploiting the resources from our land. Mm -hmm. And because during that same time of the shootout, I think many people always ask, well, why did the shootout happen? What was going on? But people just don't know that during that very same time period, Richard Wilson, who was then the acting tribal chairman, was in Washington, D.C., signing away one-eighth of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the Black Hills of South Dakota, which is 133,000 acres of land and valued at billions of do dollars of uranium deposits that are being strip-mined out of there by over 40 corporations today. And today we have a liberation of Lakota people who have occupied 800 acres of land, which is now called the Yellow Thunder Community, which is one of the richest areas in which the deposits are, are laying. Mm -hmm. And so the government is very uptight about this at this time because throughout their years' existence there, on April 4th, they have gained the support of not only international support but over 40 congressmen who are now trying to pass a bill to the National Park Services to clear the land for the Indians' use. Because everybody knows that there's a big controversy about who really owns the hills. Does the United States government or does the Indian people? And how long can we be blind to, to go along with a government who has all the control of all the policies, law enforcement, the laws, and everything to back them up?